Hi, um, I am Atish. I work for, also work for Western Digital and uh, I am here to talk about the booting in Risk V, what's current state and what's the road ahead uh, for the booting flow in Risk V. And before we start, um, just wanted to get a feel like how many of you think like having a standard booting is necessary for any platform, especially for Risk V where it's growing, right? So, yeah, my question is still continuing, so you can raise your hands. Yes. <laughs> Both. Good, because we do not want a diff. So, especially in booting land, we don't, different or being unique doesn't bring value, it brings chaos. Being standard, being boring actually brings value because if a user knows how to build a, how to boot a x86 or ARM system, he should be able to, or reach C should be able to boot a risk five system. That's the whole uh, agenda of the talk is we want to make it more standard and standard. So we want to follow more open source as open source as possible and follow the protocols or uh, methods that already open source systems already uses. So here's a brief agenda of the talk that I'll be going through and starting the talk. So here is a brief uh, most commonly used embedded boot flow a multi stage boot flow where you can uh, have uh, different open source uh, and all of them are actually open source and that's how all of the embedded uh, world actually works so you can have a different combination of it and you can definitely run it but that's what the recommended boot flow is where actually you can go ahead and uh, run your software so to start with first would be your zero stage bootloader which basically does load the next one gets executed from the ROM, that's what, whenever the power on reset, that's what get, gets started. Next is, is the first stage bootloader, which basically uh, runs also as a loader, loads, has the should have the capability to load all the next stages, something like the next runtime service provider, next uh, the real bootloader, or for the matter, uh, Linux as well. But um, given the what software open source project we're using, it may be doing actually doing that or may not be doing that. So uh, currently uh, in RISC-V land, there's FSBL, which is a sci fi specific one. There is U-Boot SPL, which is the uh, secondary program load from U-Boot. And then there is Core Boot, which uh, does that job. Then there is a runtime service provider, which, would, which is the only uh, software piece run actually resident after Linux boot. So when actually Linux boots, all of those other pieces basically overwritten because we don't need them, but we need the runtime service pro because that's where the OS actually need anything that needs to communicate downstream with the firmware, that's where uh, the runtime service provider comes in. And OpenSPI currently uh, provides that for RISC-V. Then there is U-Boot, which acts as a last stage bootloader. So last stage bootloader, which mostly you actually see, like where you configure your menu or uh, actually boot Linux. And uh, the other bootloader, so these are the already upstream available, that's why it's there. There is also Grub, which would eventually be fit in here, which would also be act as a last stage bootloader. And then uh, currently core boot doesn't, uh, can boot technically EU boot, but directly just loads Linux and then loads upon SPI. So and then it asks open SPI to jump to Linux. U-Boot SPL also board loads OpenSPA U-Boot, and then you can uh, switch to, jump to U-Boot from OpenSPA and then get to Linux from U-Boot using your MMC or network, anything. So this basically summarizes what all soft open source software projects we use for bootloading uh, boot and uh, for booting, and then where the status is, is uh, this slide will talk about what's the current upstream status. So U-Boot and uh, Core Boot status uh, has been pretty, uh, pretty solid. Uh, the recently, the U-Boot SPL patches started uh, landing in. So we have already have Andy stick patches, we already have QME patches, High Five Unleashed patches are already in the mailing list, should be much soon. Core Boot is pretty good as well, both of them uses OpenSBI format dynamic. There is new kit in the block, Orboot. Uh, Ran has a talk after my talk, which we'd be talking about Orboot. Then there is OpenSBI. These are the release version and uh, the stats. Uh, you can go to the OpenSBI project and figure out where is the release version and all. Currently, we are at 0 0.5. And there is Little Kernel, 
which is a bootloader for Android, and I recently noticed that they also have support for Risk Five. Does that mean there will be Android on Risk Five? I don't know. I'm not claiming anything. Whoever has done, you can ask them. Maybe one day we are all here for Risk Five world domination, so why not? So, so these uh, now I explain which all software pieces are there, what software projects are used in the bootloading, and uh, what's the state. So. We're pretty much in good step except UFI and Grub, which will eventually have some slides at the end. But the other part uh, that we are trying to modify is, so in a in a modern era system, there are multi. Every system is a multiprocessor mostly. So the other part of it is how does each CPU actually enters into different multi stages and then actually lands in boots Linux. So currently is used as a random booting. When I say random booting, all of the hard CPUs, or risk 5 as favorably called hearts, so hardware threads. So actually, uh, randomly jumps into Linux, and I'll explain how does it work. So for the future slides, yellow box, Linux kernel, green box, bootloader. There is no relation with why the color is being chosen. It's because my color sense are really bad. So there is bootloader, Linux kernel, assuming there are, let's say, four hearts in the system. And when it tries to boot Linux, all of them jump to Linux together. So since all of them jump together, there has to be arbitration. So one gets chosen to be this, uh, the booting heart. All other, what do they do? They just keep on waiting until this heart actually does all the kernel initialization and actually then wakes up. Uh, actually configure the per CPU variable so that these are can proceed. So once it does the kernel installation, it actually goes and sets the stack pointer for each CPU, and then they go and uh, proceed. So simple enough, it's, it keeps the boot code simple, and uh, nothing really uh, issues with it, is it? Do you see any issues with it? Yes, what's the issue? Yes. Yeah. So what happens is each bootloader has to now uh, initialize uh, all the devices, and then they have to do it for SMP. So imagine with one bootloader, it's okay, but imagine there are like multiple bootloaders. So what happens then? Let's say I have like two stage bootloader now. Now every stage, the same thing will happen. Every stage there will be multi core. Then one, there will be a lottery. There will be a one core will be going forward and then waiting. All other cores will be waiting. So what happens is, let's say, doesn't matter. Uh, so the stage number is doesn't matter. It's not corresponding to what actual stage is. For now, it's just an illustration purpose. So let's say first all of them enters into stage one or stage two. Doesn't matter. Then one gets chosen. All of them waits again. That heart sends an IPI to wake them up after it does all the initialization, as you said, all the driver initialization, then all of them actually wakes up from an interrupt. Then all of them again jumps to the second stage. Again, one gets chosen. It can be any heart. So it doesn't have to be the first heart that gets. So every stage, it can be a random heart. Then that again sends an IPI. Other are waiting. It comes out of the IPI. Then all of them together again jumps to Linux, and then you know the process how it uh, processes in the Linux. So that's the problem. As we have more stages, this gets complicated. The other issue is now all the hearts are in Linux, actively running, and there is no way to uh, tell. Uh, there is no way for Linux to actually return the heart to the uh, the bootloader or the runtime service provider. That complicates your CPU hot plug and K exec. So for k-exec, what happens is uh, it stops all the hearts, and then one heart boots another kernel. When it boots another kernel, all other hearts, if you are managing it in the kernel, then you have to, you're, at the same time, you are keeping that kernel resident code, and also you are booting another kernel. So you have to manage that code, and you have to be, make sure that the other kernel doesn't override the memory. Similarly, hot plug, you have to manage the hearts in the interrupt. Sorry, manage the interrupts in kernel, 
while uh, stopping the hearts. And then while bringing up, you have to bring it up in kernel, which is not exactly stopping the heart because supervisor has still access to the those hearts. So other alternate approach uh, to how does the heart boot actually is uh, ordered booting. So most of the other ISAs, other architectures have already implemented this. This is the standard way of booting where one heart goes through all the way to Linux and then it brings up all the hearts one by one, which simplifies CPU hot plug and kexec uh, pretty much because now in CPU hot plug, kexec or normal booting, all of them uses similar approach. All of them use the, not similar, exactly same code path. The firmware keeps the one heart, uh, let one heart go and keeps all other heart. And then whenever you need to start or stop, all of them return to the firmware and then it, you can start and stop using uh, some calls which I'll be explaining later. Now, uh, so how does the order booting looks like? Same, uh, let's say the bootloader and Linux kernel. There is two stages. Now, the, fir the first stage, uh, will have a lottery because uh, otherwise you have to assign saying that this is my boot heart, which is may not be available. That heart number may not be available in a system. So one lottery is okay. Then that heart gets chosen as the boot heart is, and all of them actually goes and wait there. That heart actually goes and uh, proceed to all of the stages. So it goes to the next stage that heart continues to the Linux. Linux actually does all the initialization. Then it now it's ready to bring all the hearts. So it makes a call to the firmware or to the runtime service provider. Then uh, it receives that call. That's when it sends the IPIs to the hearts actually waiting there. And then all of them heart wakes up. And now all these stage, middle stages, which are not anymore resident in the code. So we do not have to modify anything related to SMP in those stages. And then all the other hearts, know where to jump to Linux, it directly jumps and then starts running Linux. So that's the uh, advantage of ordered booting and that's how the ordered booting will work. Now, uh, another advantage is, let's say you want to add one more stage. The other stage doesn't have to do anything. The other stage, you that hat only jumps to, instead of jumping to Linux, it just jumps to the next stage it does whatever that stage need to do, and then it jumps to Linux, and then the entire process remains same. Hi. How do the stages after stage one know not to do a lottery? Sorry. How do the other stages know not to do a lottery? So they, no, they do not have to do lottery. Uh, can you repeat the question, so the question was, how do the other stages do the lottery, right? No, because they know how to not do the lottery. Oh, because they are not now receiving. Uh, they are not getting all the hearts. All the hearts are not available there. So it's only one heart going forward. So they do not have to do lottery. Okay, so how do we do the bring up, uh, bringing up and uh, close, stopping the hearts from the firmware with the new set of SBI calls? Uh, the I'll not go through the details. It's available in the spec. Uh, it's already merged. So, and the patches are also available in the open, OpenSBA and Linux kernel patches are already in the mailing list. So you can take a look and uh, give feedback. Uh, I just recently posted. So with that, uh, order booting feature, the biggest issue we had, not biggest, but the one of the issue we had is how do we maintain backward compatibility? Because now you have older software running, doing random booting with all the bootloaders actually trying to do the lottery thing. And then with the newer software, it's not anymore, do not want them to do it. So this is the backward compatibility table. If you are using OpenSBI or Linux kernel master, you're good, you will obviously get the order booting. If you are using any of the older version of OpenSBI, then uh, with or without HSM patches, it will detect that it does not have the uh, HSM extension. So it will just uh, go back to the default uh, random booting. Same thing if you are using BBL or any other older, very old OpenSBA, which is older than 0 0.5, it will also fall back to the random booting. But if you are using master branch of OpenSBA, which will have OpenSBA, uh, the HSM patches and 
uh, you are using Linux kernel without HSM patches, then you will only get one core because now the Linux kernel thinks that oh, HSM extension is supported, but it's actually not implemented. Linux kernel basically is not making those calls, so you will not get SMP booting. So if you want to use the OpenSPA master, uh, you have to use the Linux kernel patches. And it's not current master, so there will be, oh, we are waiting for the spec, SBA spec to be merged. Uh, the replacement extension on 0 0.2. Once that's done, we'll release 0 0.6. So 0 0.6 will be without HSM patches, and anything beyond 0 0.6 will have HSM patches. So you should go and pick up the master of both kernel and OpenSBI to have uh, ordered booting and then CPU hot block exec, which will follow. Now, the last piece, as I uh, promised in the beginning, is uh, UFI. Uh, so thanks to Alex uh, Abner, uh, the EDK2 uh, UFI already, it's almost uh, getting merged. Uh, there's a talk by Leif uh, today afternoon that will discuss more details on this. Uh, U-boot grub support has already been there like for a long time. The only missing piece was EFI stub, which uh, I got it working like a couple of weeks ago. So it basically, Put a EFI Linux header on a peak of header on top of Linux image header, so it fakes Linux image as a uh, EFI executable to the uh, whatever the your loader, so EDK2 or U boot. So that's how it basically treats it as a the, you can boot Linux using uh, entire UFI protocol. Now with all these features, the one thing we also want to be like as I said, standardization is important. So we also want to get into the EBBR compliance. So as per uh, my understanding, EBBR is a specification that allows interoperability between different hardware platforms. So once your hardware platform conforms to EBBR, you know that for sure you have these many features and this is how you boot. So as per the technical requirements, we are almost there. We have to implement, uh, we have to implement the runtime services, few of them, and then or just say that we are not supporting runtime services, but that feature has to be there. Other than that, startup protocol and f the startup protocol is basically all the hearts booting the flow I explained, and then the format storage which requires you to be on GPT partition, and we already have uh, GPT. You are already using GPT partition. The part I'm not sure, and I'm hoping I'll talk to some folks and get it clarity, is not technically political, maybe logistics, uh, because it's hosted in ARM um, software and the copyright has ARM um, limited contributors, so I'm not sure whether we can get into that. So I have to uh, open to discussion how do we get that work. Okay, you only have 10 seconds to yes, I'm done. So there's a so for the future work, we need to upstream the patches, we need to upstream the spec, and then once all those are done, hopefully we can make the EBBR compliant, and then do a KXA and KDAP implementation which would be nice to have all those features and help you debugging. So I guess I'm done. Yes. yes. Okay. I had a demo, but I guess I'm running out of time. So if you want to see the UFI boot, I would running so you can talk to me after the talk and you can, I can show you. Thanks.